I think of movement, I think of water um, that's flowing forward, uh, that's, that's moving, uh, that is consistent. Movement represents change, growth, and development. I think a movement is about um, being risky and bold and creative. Jesus Christ, if we think about it, was a movement unto himself. Christ and his disciples were on a journey and created change and they were a movement that changed the world forever. I am not a movement. An individual is not a movement. It takes a group to be a movement. Um, not necessarily a consensus, but a connectedness. And it can be diverse. Folks are on a journey. Folks are um, going to a place, they have a particular destination in mind. And for me, as a member of the Christian Church, Disciples of Christ, we come from all walks of life, uh, but we have the same destination in mind. Um, we, we look different, we act different, but we're all in sync. Uh, we're syncopated with heaven. Being a movement for wholeness means walking with Jesus Christ today and allowing God to open to us fresh ways to meet those challenges. church is and what church is supposed to be. It is a prophetic ministry meant by Jesus Christ to help all people. I was raised in this church. It's one of the most welcoming, loving, caring, and compassionate churches that I've ever been a part of. This church has grown throughout the years, has always served the public, always done great things for the community. I love being a part of a place that's doing something beyond the walls. For the people in our community. No matter what race, creed, color. It's a loving church, and no matter how much trouble you're in, they are here to help you. Because when you go to a church, and the church only cares about your soul, that's called Gnosticism. It's an ancient heretical form of Christian faith that says you don't matter, just your soul, what's inside you. And that's the same hypocritical faith that was taught by the slave masters to the slave. We want to baptize you so your soul will go to heaven. But you can't use your baptism to get your hind parts out of slavery. And I don't know that Jesus. Though the decades march on, the dream lives. We are here assembled for hope. Courage and commitment continued by torchbearers like Greenleaf Christian Church in Goldsboro, building up the Goldsboro community. They're located here on this corner, but they reach so much further than that. It's dealing with the community as a whole. It's not excluding anybody. We are about those that have less than, that are disenfranchised, that have no hope. And coming here, we have a pastor, a shepherd, the angel of this house, who gives us the word of God, and we live it out. 
Reverend Dr. Barber is the chairperson of the Rebuilding Broken Places Community Development Corporation. The facility provides on-site job training, child care and meals for children, and tutoring. The corporation also offers home buying workshops and built homes for first-time home buyers and low-income families. You'll often find Greenleaf at the state capitol in Raleigh. We are not a in the four walls church, we are in the community church. That works to advance social justice in North Carolina. Hello, Ms. Barbara. We think it's time for legislators to stop being ideologues, Republicans, Democrats, think about these people. I love the teachings of my pastor. I love our Moral Monday. The Moral Monday events demonstrate a classic David versus Goliath struggle. The Reverend taking on a right-leaning state legislature that has introduced an avalanche of extreme policies that hurt students, the poor, and the sick. There's something inside so strong. The more you refuse to hear my I love Greenleaf mostly because Reverend Barber preaches the word of God. The role of the ark was to protect. The role of Jesus come unto me all you'd had let was to protect. And the role of the church, the power of being the church is to be not only a church that preaches good news, but protects people with good deeds. By this love, all persons will know that you are God's disciples. Greenleaf loves you for who you are. They see you through God's eyes. I've raised two children here. And I just feel at home when I'm here. It is about giving, but it's also about learning. Learning the true definition of what Christ's purpose in this world was about. The Lord saved me, but through coming to Greenleaf and listening to the God within my past and God within my members, I have a defined mission. I know what I am to do with my salvation. Besides just sit there and fast and go to church and Sunday school, I know how to accomplish my assignments. It is a church that loves everybody, a church that welcomes everybody because we serve a God that's a God of everybody. And I'm just glad to be a part of a place that is so loving and welcoming. This is a good place to raise your children, get foundation in the Word. We indeed are living out being concerned about the total man, just not about the soul and trying to ensure that they get to heaven, but to ensure that they enjoy part of heaven while we're here on this earth. Thank God for Jesus and being a member of a church that cares about God's people. We love you and we thank you. Good morning. It is such a joy and a privilege to be here at Greenleaf Christian Church on this morning and to welcome each and every one of you to our Sunday morning worship celebration. And so for just a moment, we want to ask you to join in with us. You have time to call a friend, call a neighbor, and ask them to join in with you as you share in this worship celebration, for we here at Greenleaf are determined to show you the love of God. We want to lift a hymn this morning for, you know, we've gotten away, some of us, from the hymns of the church. And even though the melody may not be familiar to you, the words will be. And the hymn this morning is The Solid Rock. Thank you. 
For a like strong you, rock that we like stand, you. Hallelujah. we give you glory. Supporting us. Real, real, Jesus. 
Jesus is real to me. Oh, yes, he gives me victory. So many people doubt him. I can't live without him. That is why I love him so. Because Jesus is real, real to me. Say it again, yes, he's real. Listen, y'all. Well, I woke up one morning. That's it. My pillow was wet with tears. Oh, yes. I called on Christ and my Savior. Call it, call it. I knew he would hear. Yes, he so many people doubt him. Oh, yes. I can't live without him. That is why I love him so, because Jesus is real to me. Well, in oh, the morning, he's, he's real. real. He's real. Oh, oh, Jesus. Jesus is real to me. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Say he's real, he's real, oh Jesus, Jesus is real to me, oh Somebody out there got happy out there. Somebody in the house right now just clapping their hands. Oh, Hallelujah. Yes. Oh, real, real. Jesus is real to me. Yeah. Oh, yes. yes. He gives me the victory. My God. So many people doubt him. My Lord. For myself, oh, yes. he gives me a victory every day of my life. So many people die. You can do what you want. I can't live without. I can't live 
with honey. I can't live without him. Oh, I can't live without him. Not a day. I can't live without him. Oh, not a minute. Oh. I can't live without him. Nowhere I go. I can't live without him. him. Jesus. That is why I love him so. Jesus. God, we thank you. We thank you for incarnated presence. We thank you for being a very present help in the time of trouble. We thank you for being as real to us in our soul. Yes, God is real. Some folk may doubt, but yes, God is real. We thank you, God, for every day, for every hour. Now, Lord, we know that whenever you call men and women to preach, you take this risk of putting treasure in trash, treasure in an earthen vessel, that the excellency of the power might be of thee and not of us. So in all of your real power, hide us behind the cross, cover us in your blood and grace and love and mercy. Let the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our strength and blessed redeemer, come Holy Spirit, come with preaching, hearing, and teaching power. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. It is good to gather with you all all over the world, all over the county, all over the country, all over the city, here at Greenleaf Christian Church, our morning worship service, where we are determined to show you the love of God. It's just something that's down in us because of what the Lord has done through us. How many? We um, this morning certainly want to thank our praise and worship team always and for being here, our assistant pastor, Elder Bell, and our psalmist, Sister Felicia Leach. Always want to thank our uh, ministry team. Uh, who make sure the videos are right and the sound is right, uh, despite all of my strange directions. <laughs> um, and thank all of you for coming. I want to encourage you all to, there's a spot for your shot. There's a spot for your shot. Uh, you ought to take it, read up it, ask every question you know, find out. But I took one this week um, to encourage others. Uh, you know, I've had a battle an immune deficiency all this year. Took the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, one shot, you're out. Um, there's a spot for your shot. And we are saying to the people that are engaged in the medical delivery, don't say that black and brown people <coughs> are so suspicious they won't take the shot. Right now, the issue is not doubting suspicion, it's delivery of services put it in our communities, if you bring it mobile as we can, uh, pe the people's delivery of the service will overcome the doubts. I hear some shh in the sound system. Need y'all to check it out. It's distracting, please. They, I don't know if they hear it online, but I hear it up here, so you might have to come here. And so I want to encourage you to do that as we do it, not only for ourselves, uh, but we also do it for one another. You know, in the real sense, we are our brother and sister's keeper. Is that on? Our brother and sister's keeper. Forgive me, those of you on video. I, that's just me moving something around. And uh, we are required to love our neighbor as ourselves. That's why I don't understand folk that don't want to wear a mask. And then when they get sick, they say they should have worn a mask. I just don't understand that. When somebody in their family dies, then they crying and carrying on. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't have to get beat up to know that a beating hurts. We shouldn't have to get this, this um, pandemic, this, this, this virus, to know that's deadly. Uh, 500,000 people dying <laughs> hasn't taught you yet. What else do you need? Uh, and so let us love one another. Let us care for one another. We also want to uh, make note this morning and in this Lenten season, think about not only what you give up, but what you take in, spend time 
with the Lord, not just as individuals, but in groups, on Zoom calls, think deeply about the faith. And um, as we move towards Easter Sunday, uh, we're going to be outside again. Have a, we're going to have a big outside Easter pageant. We're going to figure that out uh, in April. I also want to let you know that on the 21st of this month, uh, we'll be preaching. Our service will be broadcast, but we'll be broadcasting uh, from the historic Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta, the spiritual home of Dr. Martin Luther King, my dear friend, the Reverend Dr. now Senator of Warnack, he called and asked would we come so the congregation would like us to come and, and, and preach for that service. It is an humbling request and um, I'm so thankful to be able to accept it. And so that's on the April uh, 21st. Uh, you know, in the midst of this pandemic, uh, we've been able to be a lot of places by Zoom, <laughs> sometimes multiple places in one day. And so we are so thankful to God for all of the ways we can continue to minister. I want this morning to um, continue in the book of Matthew, uh, after Matthew chapter 4. I want to go to Matthew chapter 5. And uh, Reverend Ozell, I think about every, maybe even every couple of years, surely no less than every five years, maybe once a year, uh, gospel preacher, pastor ought to work the people through the Beatitudes. The kingdom's way of seeing, God's kingdom way of seeing life over against the forces of this world. And um, in the Matthew chapter 5, I want to start in the King James Version and then come to another version, but chapter 5, verse 1 says, and seeing the multitudes, he, meaning Jesus, went up into the mountain and when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. And this morning, I want to uh, meander around this text and try to have a conversation, preaching conversation with you on the subject, redefining what it means to be blessed. Redefining what it means to, to be blessed. Jesus had come through a lot already in his first days of ministry. He had been baptized at around 30 in the Jordan. And when he was baptized, the Bible says a dove descended from heaven and a voice declared that was the voice of God, this is my son, in whom I am well pleased. But that announcement, is everything okay? I'm pausing, y'all, because I see some ruckus in the back. Is everything okay with sound? I need an answer. A thumbs up or something. Hello. Talk to me, to Corey. All right. Jesus had um, heard that, and but he knew that when he heard that pronouncement from God, it also set him on a course toward Calvary and it would only be about three years two and a half before he would walk 
the Via Della Rosa, the way of death. And they would, on a garbage dump called Golgotha, hang him high, stretch him wide, nail him to the cross, pierce him in the side. And for me, he died. What would you do if you knew you only had three years to serve the Lord? I'm, I'm thinking here for a moment, um, and uh, I just need the sound folk to make her, because I have very sensitive ears. Is everything okay? I don't want to keep going. I'm hearing an echo a little bit too much reverb in this mic. It's feedback. And I need y'all to give me some signals now. People out in video are fine. Bring that back up a little bit. I need it to be where it was the last time I was in this pulpit. All right. People online are saying, my, are you all online back there? Sir? Are you all listening online? Okay. Well, they say it's low. All right. Is it up now, y'all online, video folk online? Huh? We better now? Thank, thank our techs for, uh, who are all over the world. They ain't going to let you. They want to hear this word. <laughs> and uh, y'all might want to, in the back, make sure you have on earphones so that you're hearing. I don't know what you have in your ears, but you may want to have on earphones. You got earplugs in, earbuds in? Okay. So you may want to have them on so you can hear what's both going out, but also hear what's inside the church. Jesus knew he'd only had about three years. What would you do if God gave you an assignment for three years and you knew it would end up in death and you had no option really but to either turn your back on God or turn fully into God? Jesus knew this was real because <laughs> as soon as the Lord told him, this is my son whom I'm well pleased, the same spirit drove him into the wilderness and the devil tried to take him out with temptations. After 40 days and 40 nights fasting without food. And then as soon as that was over, the Bible says, and the devil left him for a season. In other words, I'm coming back. Then Jesus decides to preach in his own hometown, the ghetto of Nazareth, where surely the people would hear a message about God being concerned about the poor and the oppressed. But by that time, the ghetto had been so undermined and brainwashed by the powers and the forces of oppression that the ghetto church that should have been the very church that would love a message of justice, good news to the poor, recovery of sight to the blind, acceptance of all people. The ghetto church turned on him. The very people he was trying to love, that he had come incarnate to say, God love you, they had become so brainwashed and enamored by the forces of oppression that when they heard freedom, they didn't even know what it sounded like. In his own hometown, his own hood, his own peeps. The Bible says, the day he simply said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach good news to the poor, healing to the brokenhearted, recovery of sight to the blind, deliverance to the captive. The day he declared the acceptable year of the Lord, acceptance for everyone. And the day he said that this is not just for one group of people, this is for all people, it says they became angry and sought to kill him. So he knew that this thing about three years later dying was for real because they were already trying to kill him and he hadn't preached but his first public son. Then he knew that it was serious because his cousin born six months prior to him who 
the Holy Spirit had caused to leap in the womb when his mama walked past John the Baptist's mama, his cousin, the prophet of Jordan, was in jail because he dared to speak the truth, dared to challenge a narcissistic leader named Herod, and he would be killed. What would you do if you got an assignment from God and you knew that it probably was going to cost you your life. No, it was going to cost you your life. You had about two and a half years, and all of the evidence was pointing to once you start down this track, you will end up on Calvary's cross. One of the things you probably would want to do is make sure you're clear about what it means to be blessed. You see, when Jesus was preaching at this time, some were saying that to be blessed was to be safe and not say anything that Caesar or Herod might disagree with. To be blessed was to be on the side of oppression. To be blessed was to, to be on the side of wealthy and not on the side of the poor. To be blessed was to go along to get along. To be blessed was to do everything you could to ensure that the forces of injustice would not say anything against you. But if that was what blessing was, then Jesus wasn't blessed. <laughs> if, if just merely having things is the sign of being blessed, blessed because the Son of Man had nowhere. Even the ghetto didn't want him at first. Son of man had nowhere to lay his head. So if I'm going toward the cross and it's going to cost me everything, I might need to be clear about what blessing or blessedness really means. It's possible that I cannot accept the definition of the blessing of the world because I can't do this. I can't walk where God if on top of walking where God tells me to walk, it also means it's not a blessed walk. At least if I'm going. other night, Dondrell Washington, and there's a line in there where he tells his wife that later on they would get back together actually after he got incarcerated, but he said, I can't do this time like this. And in some sense, Jesus was saying, I can't do this, and I can't teach the folk that I need to help me do this unless we redefine what this really is, what blessings really is, over and against what the world and the systems of this world and the systems of Satan say blessings really are. And so, in the midst of the struggle, in the midst of the battle, the Bible says, over there in Capernaum, where things were, where he was announcing the kingdom of God and change had come, that he stopped to have a teaching. <laughs> like a rabbi in the Jewish tradition, people were following, but he knew he had to make sure they were following for the right reason. He had to make sure that they understood what the kingdom's concept of blessing is and that they couldn't bring that other baggage into this work because if they held on to ideas of blessedness that were not of God and of, of, of the way of the gospel, then they would burn out. They would actually turn. They would end up leaving 
the gospel and going back to the ways the world defines blessings. And so, like a rabbi, he climbs up this hill, this mountain. And I love the imagery here. He sits down. You know, I'm not a lazy preacher. I've been standing on my legs for some 32 years trying to preach this gospel. But I sure wish love were long for the day when you can preach and just sit down and folk don't think that ain't preaching. <laughs> I long for the day when some people are not so caught up in the theatrics, but they're more interested in the theology. I long for the day you don't have to work so hard to teach something that's so right. <laughs> he went up the mountain and he sat down and he called his students, disciples, unto him. And the other people were around the base. And Jesus decided both for himself and for his people to present a sermon on the mount that would redefine the meaning of blessings and blessedness so that as they walked on the journey, when things got hard, they would not confuse the hardness with not being blessed. Because there is a place in the anointing <clears throat> that you must understand that your anointing will attract a certain hardness and the hardness that you receive because you walk in the anointing and the way of God is a sign of being blessed. And if you don't face anything in, as you walk with God, that is not a sign of being blessed. That's a sign that the enemy doesn't see you as a threat. And every now and then, down through history, not only did this happen in the Sermon on the Mount, but the truth is there are other moments in history that make clear this need to redefine what it means to be blessed. Let me step away from the text and come back to the text. Today, is the 56th anniversary of Bloody Sunday. I have a dear friend that has written a book, Ibram Kendi, entitled How to Be an Anti-Racist. And in this book, he says, the only way to undo racism is to consistently, consistently identify it and describe it redefine it and dismantle it. He said, to be anti-racist first must begin with redefining how this culture and society has been defined. He also wrote another little book with Keisha Bl Blaine, Ibram Kendi, Keisha Blaine. They let me have a little humble place in that right little chapter called 400 Souls. And it is the retelling and the redefining of the African-American experience. Because some people think, you know, all that the African-American experience is slavery, Civil War, Carter G. Woodson, Martin Luther King, Obama. Mm -mm. There needs to be a redefining. And every so often, not only do we need the books that redefine, we need moments, places. And in a sense, Selma and the Selma to Montgomery March was a sermon on the mount for the movement. The Edmund Pettus Bridge, Bloody Sunday, were the backdrop for the movement's sermon on the mount and like in the time of Jesus. There was death around, there was pain around, there was injustice around, but the movement had to make a decision to redefine what freedom and real citizenship meant 
just like the, Jesus had to make a decision to redefine what blessedness really meant. Selma had to happen because there were some people, Cheryl, that had said to black folk, you got the Civil Rights Act, you're blessed, shut up. That's it. That's all. You don't need no voting rights. You don't need citizenship. You had your little march on Washington. You got the Civil Rights Act of 64. Be quiet. You don't need to be talking about voting rights and poverty and militarism. They, had def they were defining our rights and our citizenship and our freedom in very narrow terms. And Selma to Montgomery was where Dr. King and Amelia Boynton, the black woman you see in the picture who was beat on the, on the Edmunds Pettus Bridge laying down, and so many others who had been in Selma for years, so many whose names were never known, they decided that Selma would be America and the world's Sermon on the Mount. They decided that it was right there at the risk of their lives. Remember, at least two people, three people died during the Selma to Montgomery. Jimmy Lee Jackson, James Reed, and Viola Wooster. And two of them were white, James Reed and Jimmy and Viola Wooster. They died. They were killed. They were murdered. They were beaten. They were shot. But like Jesus, they still had to do this teaching to the nation. So the Edmund Pettus Bridge, the, 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 the way from Selma to Montgomery, became a modern-day Sermon on the Mount that raised the question, what should a blessed nation do? What does, bless, what does, what does blessing really mean for oppressed people? They decided, Dr. King and others decided, we have to redefine America. The America needs a second birth, a redefining. Because we've heard America say some things in her constitution, but the definition is all off. What? There's, a, there's a great gulf between what she says and what she is. You see, America had said before Selma, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and to secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity do ordain and establish this constitution for the United States, the blessings of liberty. But the movement said that, the preachers said, those gospel preachers then said, but we've got to go to Selma, from Selma to Montgomery, because we have to redefine what is meant by the blessings of liberty. What, what is meant by securing the blessings of liberty for ourselves and our posterity because some thought, Felicia, that the blessings of liberty were only for certain white people, not even all white people, <laughs> certain white people. Because at the time of the Constitution, blessings of liberty wasn't even, didn't even consider white people without land, white men without land. The blessings of liberty for some meant everybody but black people, everybody but native people. The blessings of liberty meant for some, but for others, it was not the passing on of the blessings of liberty. It was the passing on of poverty, the passing on of racism, the passing on of denial. For, for, for some, they thought the blessings of liberty was exclusive. The blessings of liberty meant we are up here and others are down here. And the Selma to Montgomery became a sermon on the mount to redefine what blessings and the blessings of liberty really mean. 
the Selma movement said, listen, blessedness, blessings of liberty has to mean justice or it's not really blessing. It has to mean love. It has to mean truth for all. It has to mean nonviolence. It has to mean white and black and brown together. It has to mean voting rights. When Dr. King stands on the steps of the uh, uh, Alabama State House after they march from Selma to Montgomery, Dr. King is like teaching like he's on the Sermon on the Mount. If you, if you ever go back, that sermon is so different then I have a dream, it's longer, it's more in depth. He takes his time. There's an audience there of 25,000 people, but his closest associates are there and it's diverse, it's of every race, creed and color. And he said, I have to redefine what blessings really mean because America's got it all wrong. And if we don't get right the meaning, what it means to be blessed, then we can never really be whole as a nation. One writer said Dr. King understood what was going on. He understood the kind of analysis that needed to happen. He understood that there needed to be a redefinition of what the blessings of liberty meant morally and theologically. Dr. King understood that denying and abridging and suppressing the right to vote and blocking people's right to living wages was not just bad policy, it was sin. It was a form of idolatry. It was contrary to God's definition of blessedness. And so, standing there like Jesus stood at the Sermon on the Mount, the movement had to redefine for America what is, what should the blessings of liberty really mean. Walk with me for just a while. C. Van Woodard wrote a book called The Strange Career of Jim Crow. And in that book, he clearly points out the segregation of the races was really not just about white people hating black people, but a political strategy employed by the greedy aristocracy in the South to keep the Southern masses, black and white, separate from each other so that they could steal all the money from both because the Southern aristocracy understood that for them, blessing meant taking all they could take from anybody they could take it from. And if that meant dividing the country, if that meant racism, then so be it. If it meant keeping poor white people near starvation wages, if it meant keeping black people as close to slavery as possible, if it meant pitting black and white people, poor black and white people are against each other, as long as they were blessed in their understanding of blessedness. As long as they had all the money and all the power. And so Dr. King says, let me take this on and redefine what blessings really mean. Listen, if I can just, just for a moment channel that sermon in, in Montgomery. He said, this is what was known as the populist movement. The leaders of this movement began to awaken the poor white masses and the former Negro slaves to the fact that both of them were being fleeced by the aristocracy and the virgin interests. And not only that, they began uniting black Negroes and white masses in the 19th century. And they began putting them into a voting block that threatened to drive the bourbon interest from the command post of political power in the South. And when the Southern aristocracy saw this, they immediately began to engineer a segregated society. They could not allow for a unified society because a unified society would mean that poor whites and poor blacks came together and pushed them out of political power. And then Dr. King says, follow me because this is very important for us to understand the roots of racism and the denial of the right to vote in this country. He says the aristocracy, through their control of mass media, they revised the doctrine of white supremacy. They saturated the thinking of poor white masses with it. They began to cloud their minds to teach them that to be blessed would mean they were separate from poor black Negroes. 
and they did it to create division, and that crippled and stopped, and eventually destroyed the populist movement. And so it may be said for the aristocracy to hold on to their power. The white, greedy man took the world and gave the Negro Jesus, and then it may be said of the Reconstruction era that the Southern aristocracy took the world and gave the poor white man Jim Crow. He gave him Jim Crow. And when his wrinkled stomach cried out for the food that his empty pockets could not provide, he fed him Jim Crow. A psychological bird that told him that no matter how bad off he was, at least he was a white man, better than a black man. And he ate Jim Crow, and he ate Jim Crow. And when his undernourished children cried out for the necessities that his low wages could not provide, the aristocracy showed them the Jim Crow signs on the buses and in the stores and said, yeah, but you blessed because at least you ain't a black man. And this form of thinking became the last outpost of psychological oblivion. And this is what you need to understand. This is King's saying. The threat of the free exercise of the ballot by both the Negro and the white masses alike coming together is why segregated society was fueled and paid for by the wealthy aristocracy. They segregated Southern money from poor white folk. They segregated Southern moors from rich white folk. They segregated Southern churches from Christianity. They segregated Southern minds from honest thinking, and they segregated the Negro from everything. And that's what happened when the Negro and white masses of the South threatened to unite and come together and build a great society, a society of justice where none would prey upon the weakness of others, where everybody would be blessed, a society of plenty where greed and poverty would be done away with. Segregation was designed to make sure everybody was not blessed. And in essence, the white aristocracy taught the poor white masses that the only blessing you need to be concerned about is not being a black man. And the Selma to Montgomery march was the Sermon on the Mount in the 1960s to redefine blessedness. And people were willing to die for it because they knew what real blessedness was. And real blessedness was refusing to go along with the system of racism and Jim Crow, even if it cost your life. Real blessedness was working to pull white and black people together to fight for justice in this country. Real blessedness was not believing the lie of racism and segregation, even if it meant they beat the hell out of you on the bridge. The, ble the beating was a blessing because the beating said they might hit you in the head, but they ain't got your mind. And it's sad to say today that too many people still today haven't listened to the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew, and they haven't listened on the, uh, the Sermon on the Mount from Selma. Oh, I know it so. When I watch Friday, not as a politician, but as a preacher. A preacher who knows that Isaiah 10 says, woe unto those who legislate evil and rob the poor of their rights and make women and children their prey. A preacher that knows Matthew 25 says that every nation will be judged by how it treats the least of these. And when I watched 50, 49, if you will, Republicans, who have been on the side of white supremacy and Trump be joined by eight all-white Democrats, one woman and seven men, who chose to block guaranteed unemployment for poor and low-wealth white and black people and brown people, sick leave, and a minimum wage increase of $15 an hour that would have lifted 45% of black people, black poor and low wealth workers out of poverty, would have lifted 62 million black, white, brown, and indigenous people 
out of poverty. And when I saw those 50, 49 joined by those eight, and all of the eight were white, all of them millionaires, all of them couldn't live a day off of what poor and low-wealth people live. There's, it wouldn't have hurt them to vote right. It would only have helped 62 million people. But when I saw them and one lady put her thumb down and shook a little bit, cinema out of Arizona, I knew right then that they hadn't read the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew, and they surely haven't read the Sermon on the Mount from Selma. And how dare any of them now go to Selma and say, we honor the people that marched across this bridge. When the Selma to Montgomery march was about voting rights and economic justice. When I see people who get power and they think it's a blessing for them to health care, have health care bail, but then they deny other people health care, they haven't read the real definition of blessing. There's no way in the world they could have read it, not have really read it and heard it what Matthew 5 says or what Selma says. When, when I see people foaming at the mouth in an insurrection, pushing white supremacy, when I, you know, some, I just sat back for a minute and watched this guy with this crazy hat on and horns stand up in the Senate after they had broken in and said, let's pray. And let's pray in the name of Jesus. And he commenced to pray and they commenced to bow and then they had the nerve to say, amen, I am convinced that somebody's got a faulty understanding of what blessedness is. And they have not read the redefinition of blessedness by Jesus in Matthew 5, nor have they ever heard and taken to heart the def redefining of blessedness from Selma and Montgomery. But it's not just out there in politics. In our personal lives, don't you know we are not blessed? until we understand that life is really about what you do for others and not just what you do for your sorry self alone. And I do mean that, sorry. You are sorry if all you care about is yourself. You're gonna have enough time alone. Wait till your casket come. While you're here, <laughs> I declare you're gonna be in that casket alone. Ain't none of your family gonna say, move over, let me, let me, let me have a piece of that. Not now one of them, I don't care. Your boo ain't gonna do it. I don't care how much he tell he love you. You mess around and die and see how alone you gonna die. <clears throat> all them folk you drank Hennessy with, smoked reefer with, all those folk you talked about other people with, I don't care how highfalutin you are, you could, be the, you could be a princess and the prince died. The princess ain't gonna say, I'll scoot over just a little bit. Undertaker, make a space for me. You gonna die alone. So since you're going to have enough time alone, you don't really understand what blessedness is until you understand that why you have a life. The real measure of blessedness is what you do for others. We don't understand what blessedness is if your religion makes you look down on other folk. That you're always trying to spend time trying to figure out how you better than other people and how their sin is worse than yours. You're trying to figure out who God doesn't love, who God doesn't care about. That's a faulty definition of blessedness. Hmm? That's a faulty definition. Any understanding of blessedness, which is nothing more than you thinking, as long as I can get all I can, put it in my can and sit on my can, and that's what makes me blessed, I hear some folk in the church sometimes. I know I'm blessed because my children ain't never been to jail. They ain't never been caught. But the real question of blessing is how many other children have you helped? How many of the children that have fallen, that have gone to jail, how many times have you reached out to other people? What does your family do for the rest of the world, not just what does your family do inside your family? We need a redefining of blessedness. Right now in this country, there are a whole lot of us, black folk I'm talking about, that owe what we do, what we have, where we can go 
to people who did fought for us and other folk left them out there by themselves. We need a redefining of what real blessedness is and that's what Jesus is doing here. So now let's, let's go back to Matthew 5, but, but, but sure, let me, let me walk back in it. Not through King James. I love, I like King James sometimes, you know, the thee and the thou. But every now and then I like to come at it through the message Bible because it comes at it a little bit different way. And I want you to hear it again. Listen, 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 listen. Verse chapter 5. When Jesus saw his ministry drawing huge. come back to that sermon one day. Everybody is not going to want to learn. <laughs> Only those that were committed come early to choir rehearsal and stay late. How about that, Bill? <laughs> See, there's a crowd that'll hang around, but there's a crowd that are, that's committed, and the crowd that's committed always wants to learn more. Arriving at a quiet place, he sat down and taught his climbing companions. He, te- he taught his climbing companions because you got to have a crowd. When you're in a movement, you got to have a few folk that really understand what it's about. I know that's bad English, but it's good theology. And this is what he said to his climbing companions. This is what he said to the real committed. He had to say it to them because if he was headed to cross where they were too. If he was going to be persecuted, they were going to be persecuted too. So they needed to know what makes this work blessed. Because cause, cause being able to say I'm blessed because nobody uh, dislikes me is not going to be something you can say in this movement. Being able to say I know I'm blessed because I have everything, you're not going to be able to say that in this movement. Being able to say I'm blessed because the political forces uh, don't, don't oppress me is not what you're going to be able to say. So Jesus says, let me tell you, you are blessed. When you're at the end of your rope, and because there's less of you, it makes room for more of God. You are blessed if you get out here and you are doing what God tells you to do. And because you're doing it, you come to the end of your rope, the end of your strength, and you don't know if you can make it. Because right there is when you will experience more of God. Right there, God will take over. Right there, God will transform your life. Right there, you will feel something within that holdeth the rain. Something within that banishes all pain. But you can't get there until you're at the end of your rope. Paul said it like this, I want to know the fellowship of his suffering that I might know the power of his resurrection. You want anointing, really? Stand for what God calls you to stand for and be willing to suffer for it and then you'll know the anointing. Love folk that aren't lovable, then you'll know the anointing. Verse 4, Jesus says, you're blessed when you feel you have lost what is most dear to you. And only then can you be embraced by the one most dear. In other words, you're blessed when you stop. You, 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 everything you hold on to that tells you who you are is gone because then you'll be forced to only accept the embrace of God. And you'll find out that the embrace of God is greater than any other thing you put trust in. Oh God. He says, verse 5, you're blessed when you're content with who you are. No more, no less. You aren't worried about what Caesar says. You aren't worried about what Herod says. You aren't worried about what the critic says. You become content of who you are, who God has made you. And, the, and he said, that's the moment 
you will find yourself proud owners of everything that can't be bought. In other words, Fast Five said, the Lord wants you to become comfortable with who you are in him so that in the midst of the hurtful moment, you can still say, this joy <laughs> that I have. The world didn't get Can't take it away. There's a place we have to come to in life where we truly believe I've decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. And then this last one, this last one, this last one today. I'll come back to the other ones next week. It says, you're blessed when you've worked up a good appetite for God. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst after right. You are blessed when you've worked up a good appetite. And he's food and drink in the best meal you'll ever eat. You're blessed when you've worked up a good appetite for God. Real blessing, y'all, is when you and I don't have an appetite just for things and greed and hate. That, you know, really, you're dangerous when you don't want nothing but what God served you. <laughs> oh, God. You're blessed when instead of craving after things and craving after hate and greed. You're blessed when we have a healthy appetite for God. Uh, to have an appetite for God, you see, is to have an appetite for love. It is to have an appetite for truth. It is to have an appetite for justice. It is to have an appetite for grace. It is to have an appetite for serving the Lord. And I must tell you, as I conclude this morning, for teaching this, for redefining what blessedness really was, for, for teaching some folk how to know they were blessed even when Herod said they weren't and Caesar said they weren't, for giving folk an understanding of what it means to walk in God that, that, that steadied and their, their soul and their spirit, that made them say, I ain't going to let nobody turn me around. That made them come to the conclusion, for God I live and for God I die. For teaching that kind of blessedness, for redefining what blessing means like that, Jesus became even more a target. Because the system wants us to think it blesses us and it can take it away. But the Sermon on the Mount says, if you get to understand what blessedness in God is, and you get a good appetite, a healthy appetite for God. Ah, that's when you become a challenge to the curses of this world. Your very life, my very life, our very life. Being blessed because we have a healthy appetite for God. In itself curses the lies about blessings of the world. Felicia, I was reading yesterday this paragraph. To millions of people around the world, the young poet Amanda Gorman represents hope, change, and the promise of a better America. But to a security guard on Friday night, the young African-American woman represented a potential threat to public safety. The Harvard-educated Gorman, who won wide acclaim with her inauguration poem, urging the nation to confront the injustices of the past, and work to create a better future says she was tailed by a security guard on her walk home. I tweeted out, I'm a preacher, but can I cuss one time? Then it says, Gorman, who lives in Los Angeles, wrote this on Twitter, that as she approached her building, the guard demanded to know if she lived there and said, you look suspicious. Now watch how she redefines blessing. She said, I showed my keys. I buzzed myself into my building. He left no apology. But this is the reality of black girls. One day you're called by the system an icon, and the next day you're called a threat. Now watch, watch her redefine blessedness. But you know, she says, in a sense, he was right. I 
am a threat. <laughs> I'm a threat to injustice. I'm a threat to inequality. I'm a threat to ignorance. And anyone who speaks the truth and walks with hope is an obvious and fatal danger to the powers that be. Sister Gorman, just like Jesus, just like those on the Selma, on the Edmund Pettus Bridge, they understood that you are blessed when you are a threat. <laughs> you are blessed when the system is suspicious that you won't go along with it. You are blessed when racism thinks you might just challenge it. You are blessed when greed knows you can, won't let it have its way anyhow. You know you are blessed when only the things of God matters most. You know you are blessed when you've got a healthy appetite for the way of God and the will of God and the hope of God and the joy of God and the peace of God and the strength of God and the grace of God and the plan of God and the purposes of God. That's when you know you're blessed. You know you're blessed when the world is suspicious that you've been with Jesus, ha! that you've spent time with the Lord, that, you, that something has happened to you. You've been changed. You've been turned around. You don't walk like you used to walk. You can't just go along to get along. You are blessed. Mm. And it's high time that we redefine blessing. Redefine that blessing is not giving me more stuff, but really blessing is when I want more God. And when I want more God, then I can make a difference in this often ungodly world. And so I want to close right here. I don't know if I can do it. I might need Felicia and Cheryl to help me. I don't know if there's a B flat somewhere. But I remember the song that says something like this. Like the woman at the well, I was seeking for things that could not Satisfied, and then I heard my Savior speaking, draw from my well that shall never run dry, fill my cup, Lord. Ha! I lift it up, Lord. Hey, Lord, come and quench, yeah, God, this thirsting of my soul, bread of heaven, yeah. feed me till I want no more, fill my cup, fill it up and make me whole mm. Mm. there are millions in this world who are craving the pleasures earthly things of gold but none can match that wondrous treasure that I find in Jesus Christ, my Lord. Oh, fill my cup, Lord. Dear God, I up, Lord. Come now. Come, I got a healthy appetite. And quench this thirsting of my, my soul. Fill it up and make me, me whole, oh, fill my cup, Lord. Here go. Oh. Oh, Jesus. I, I need you to come. Come and quench 
this testing of my soul. Bread of heaven, yeah, God, bread of heaven, bread of heaven. The word of the Lord on this morning has redefined for us what it truly means to be blessed. I know that there is someone out there whose idea of being blessed was or is to live in a gated community, to have a six-figure or more income, not to have any challenges in life. That's how we have been taught to define blessedness. But Matthew 5 has given us a new definition of what it means to be blessed. And Bishop has pointed out to us quite clearly this morning through the word of God that we ought to be concerned about others. I would challenge you this morning that you can't have that level of concern unless you invite Christ Jesus to come live in your heart. He has to be center in you. That you might know that there is more than serving yourself. There is great joy in serving others. And so I extend to you a gospel invitation that you might consider our great God and King as your Lord and Savior on this morning. That you might understand a whole new way of blessedness. I want to introduce you to someone on today who you can have what the world will say, all the troubles that they are to have in the world. But he can allow you to lie down in peace, yes, even in the midst of storms. And you don't understand it, and others don't understand it. But he gives unto you a peace that surpasses all understanding. I invite you, if you haven't tried it, try it. I promise you, you'll be glad that you did. So we extend that invitation to you. And as even the words of institution have been given over the body and the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we hope that you have somewhere. We're going to give you just a moment 
to go and find maybe some crackers, maybe some juice that you might have in the house, as he has already given the words of institution over it, that you might lift them up. Ask the Lord to fill your cup. You know, when we used to sing that, we would say, here's my cup. Here's my cup fill it up and make me whole. This morning, give your cup to the Lord. Let him fill it up that he might make you whole. Be blessed as you leave this video. Share the blessings as defined by Christ with the world and all those around you. Lord, help and hold those who've been with us today. If any are sick among us, lay your healing power and virtue among them. If any are in bereavement, God, bless them with your covering and your care. If any are struggling, let them know that in this world we will have tribulations, but you have overcome them all. Guide us. Strengthen us, move on us. We glorify your name. We thank you this morning for helping us to understand our blessedness in you and the power that it brings to us. Enable to walk in your way and in your will. And let us do it with the weight of the anointing always upon us. In Jesus' precious name, in the name of God, we pray. Amen. Sing praise to him. God bless you. Jesus. 
you. Thank you for joining us on this morning and we look to see you again on next Sunday. Join us on Wednesday night for Bible study if you will. If you don't know the number, go to our church webpage at www.greenychristianchurch or .greenychristian.org You'll be able to locate the inf information there. That's at www.greenleafchristian.doc Dot org, or you can find it on our Facebook page. If you are wondering how you can sow into this rich soil, we ask that you would go to our Facebook page, I'm sorry, our church web page again, and you will see a donate button there, or you can mail in your offerings to P.O. Box 597 275, ma'am, that's right, 27533, Goldsboro, North Carolina. Again, Thank you for joining us on this morning. Meditate in that word today out of Matthew 5 that you might know what it really means to be blessed. God bless you. See you on Wednesday or on next Sunday. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.